Materials supplied by Microsoft Corporation may be used for internal review, analysis, or research only. Any editing, reproduction, publication, rebroadcast, public showing, internet or public display is forbidden and may violate copyright law. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Microsoft Research, uh, affectionately known here as the New England Research and Development Center, or NERD. Um, my name is Alex Wade. I'm based at the main Microsoft campus back in Redmond, Washington. This is one of about a half a dozen Microsoft Research locations that we have worldwide. Uh, and thanks, everybody, for coming and joining us today. Thanks to the people who are watching this online. We are live streaming this event today. Uh, we will also be recording the event for view after the fact, if you want to do that. Um, the main thing I'd like to do today is, is really thank my co-conspirators in, in organizing this, uh, Digital Science, Amy and Caitlin, also stand up. Where's Chris and Margie and Patsy? Um, and, and also the panel chairs that you'll, you'll get to meet throughout the day. That, uh, it takes a village to put together an event like this, and I, and I really appreciate uh, all the work that went into it. So um, on the logistics side of things, very quickly, uh, the restrooms, if people didn't see them when they came in, uh, as you got off the elevator and came into the reception area, they're off to the right, just past that uh, coat closet there, uh, should you need that. The Wi-Fi code uh, information is on the top of page one of the agenda. Uh, the hashtag is also on the front of the agenda here, so please tweet freely throughout the day. Um, I will also try and, and monitor the Twitter feed, so those of you who are watching online, and have really, really important pressing questions, feel free to uh, direct message me. Uh, my uh, handle is Alex Wade. Um, or tweet them publicly, and we'll try and relay those to the speakers in the room. Uh, I think that's all I had. I want to pass the, the mic here to, to Amy to introduce our first speaker for the day. Let me just add my welcome on behalf of Digital Science to everybody here in the room and everybody attending virtually. Um, we're just so pleased to have you all here. And in many ways, this is a reprise of a meeting that was held here at Microsoft three years ago on transforming scholarly communication. And several people that were involved in that meeting are here. Um, Alyssa Goodman from Harvard had um, been the, the main brain behind pulling that meeting together. And like that meeting, this meeting is focused on showcasing um, the best new technologies for use in, in scholarly research and the communication thereof. Our hope for the day is that uh, this be a really fun, informal, discursive day. Um, we have a lot of rapid fire presentations, but we also have a lot of time for networking and discussion. And I'm really delighted to have as our keynote speaker, Jeff Builder. Um, Jeff has been Director of Strategic Initiatives at Crossref since 2006. Um, and I had the pleasure of working with him there, and then before that at Ingenta. Um, Jeff is, is a, a force of nature. Um, he is uh, known, among other things, for being a black belt in PowerPoint karaoke. <laughs> but um, whether he is ad-libbing or presenting a plan, um, he's, his passion for our field always shows through. Um, and he never fails to impress. And today he's going to talk to us about why our cyber infrastructure is so bad, or to use his word, why it's so crap, um, and what we can do um, in terms of governance of cyber infrastructure, development, operations uh, to change that direction. So over to you, Jeff. All right. Well, um, this actually uh, working. OK, fine. Well, um, first of all, thank you for, uh, for inviting me here. Um, and uh, that whole thing about the uh, PowerPoint karaoke, uh, the deep, dark secret is that every presentation I give is PowerPoint karaoke. <laughs> I'm usually just as surprised as anybody else by whatever the next slide is that comes up, uh, hence my reported <coughs> expertise in it. Um, Did you see John on the mic? Yeah, sorry. Yeah, sorry. we can't hear you. Sorry. Here we go. Thank you. Yep. OK. So I'll start again now. Um, so when, uh, uh, oh, well, let's see. <laughs> when, um, Alex asked me to give this presentation. Um, he said he invited me to give this talk. Uh, he encountered me, um, and you know we had just met each other in DC at a meeting. And a few days later, he sent me this thing and said, "Could you speak at this?" And I did my usual trick. 
I said, absolutely. He said, great, send me a title. So I sent him the most um, open-ended title I could think of uh, in order for me to be able to then decide much, much later uh, what I'd actually talk about. And um, I never really expected them then to pursue me with, uh, an abs uh, with a request for an abstract. Um, but they did, and they were quite insistent about this. And um, eventually, they actually got me at the, at the and I, I was on, in a particularly grumpy mood that day. And uh, hence the abstract that you have before me. Uh, the good news is that I've been grumpy ever since um, on this particular topic. And so I decided to actually stick to the talk. Um, and so we're going to talk about, I also, by the way, expected them to edit out the word crap. But, um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about scholarly cyber infrastructure. And, um, and one of the things that you should know about me is that I work for Crossref. Um, and if you know what Crossref is, congratulations. Um, and if you don't know what Crossref is, that's probably pretty good, uh, because it means that what we're doing at least isn't annoying you. Um, it's in the background. Um, but in addition to working at Crossref, uh, I've recently, well, relatively recently, was very involved with the ORCID initiative. And so a lot of the things that I'm talking about here actually come from the work that I've been doing, working on infrastructure projects, uh, both Crossref and ORCID, and in talking to various other people who have been working on infrastructure projects and comparing notes. And um, in particular, one of the things that I'd like to do is make sure that people understand that a lot of what we're talking about here are ideas that I've formulated with Cameron Nalen and uh, Jennifer Lynn from PLOS. Um, over the past few years, every time we meet, we talk about the state of scholarly infrastructure, uh, the problems with fund funding infrastructure projects, and so a lot of the things that we're coming that I'm talking about here are actually ideas that I developed uh, in tandem with them. So this is Cameron Nalen and Jennifer Lynn in a recent um, uh, writing retreat that we held uh, in which we were working out some of these ideas. So let's talk about infrastructure. Infra, uh, I think the root means uh, below or under. Um, but basically, we're talking about the basic um, uh, physical plant. In the, in the in meat space, we're talking about things like roads, tracks, all the stuff that enables us to actually build a civilization on top of it, to build cities, to build communities, uh, to, build, um, to build, well, civilization. And when we talk about cyber infrastructure, incidentally, I don't know, I think this is probably a dated phrase. I know it was very popular for a little uh, bit of time. Um, I'm not sure it's as popular now, but it's still useful. Um, because it does something, it talks about the relationship between exact, well, it talks about exactly what we're trying to do. And I think that there are some interesting things that you see in this description of a uh, distributed cyber, of, of, of a, sorry, of a cyber infrastructure. And one of the key phrases in here is that it talks about fundamental um, uh, processes and tools, things like data acquisition, data storage, data management. But it talks about how, um, in the case of cyber infrastructure, these things are supposed to transcend individual institutions. And I'll get on to that definition in a little while, because I don't think it goes far enough. Uh, but that is an interesting starting place. It talks about how these ki this kind of uh, infrastructure, electronic infrastructure, should transcend institutions. So why am I talking about infrastructure at a conference called Shake It Up and that features cocktails as its theme? Um, well, one of the reasons is that I routinely get asked to give talks about the future of this and the future of that, scholarly communication, science, toolkits, you name it. And one of my experiences has been that inevitably, these conferences tend to start descending into the mundane. We come in with the idea that we're going to talk about how we're going to get rid of PDFs. We're going to create a new dynamic workflow where everybody is not locked into this bizarre uh, facsimile of paper that we've been stuck with for so long. We talk about collaborative tools, collaborative editing, about social networks, about all of these fantastic things about integrating with data, about integrating with lab equipment. And then inevitably, somebody comes up with a statement like, but I don't know where to upload things. And how do I get an identifier for something? Inevitably, almost always, these conferences start descending into the mundane. They start talking about the fact that they can't actually just do simple things, like store 
the stuff that they want to be able to make available for long periods of time. To allow people to identify it, to cite it. And this is a, you know, a source of considerable frustration. And I think one of the problems that we have is that I think that there is a reluctance to address infrastructure as a first class problem in our industry. That is, in, well, I mean, and there are a number of reasons for this. Uh, the first of which is that fundamentally infrastructure is boring, right? I mean, infrastructure, if it's working, uh, tends to be invisible. The only time that it's at all interesting is when it's broken and not functioning, right? When the lights go off, uh, when you are trying to plug in your adapter and you're in a foreign country and you realize that the adapters are incompatible, um, when a DOI breaks, uh, when you try and go and retrieve a data set and you're not allowed to or you can't find it or something like that. That's when we notice infrastructure. The same thing happens with, you don't know, generally sit there and go, I'm on a highway, I'm on a highway, I'm on a highway. When the highway's got potholes in it, when it's falling down, when it's uh, falling apart, then you notice that you're on a highway. And you wonder, what on earth happened here? So one of the problems with infrastructure is that if it's working, you don't tend to notice it. It's not particularly sexy to fund things that people don't notice. Um, another problem with infrastructure, I think, is that it's associated very much with huge bureaucracies. The idea is that if you have infrastructure, you're going to have some gigantic behemoth bureaucracy that's unresponsive to, you, that to, to end users and that, um, and that, and that you, know, you can't figure out why they do the things that they do. Um, and so there's a sort of a, a, a general built-in hostility to the notion of creating these bureaucracies to administer something that ultimately, if it works, is invisible. You've got a whole bunch of things working against you. And one of the patterns that I see is that when we talk about infrastructure, particularly when we're dealing with funders, there's a classic anti-pattern that we see play out time and time again. A funder will invite the best and the brightest in a particular field to talk about the future of scholarly communication, talk about how you're going to advance scholarly um, uh, publishing or scholarly um, you know, uh, data citation, you name it. We, we have these things all the time. I get invited to one a month um, at least. And what happens is something almost entirely predictable. The funder has invited people, top researchers in their profession, and they start talking about, um, about uh, projects, and, they, and, and in the case of, of a lot of these things, they say, oh, and by the way, we need infrastructure. And then something interesting happens, all right? Because mind you, you've got researchers. Researchers, by and large, are interested in pushing things forward. They're interested in the cutting edge. They're interested in, in, the, in, the, in the things that we're not even thinking about. Generally, temperamentally, the last thing on earth they ever want to think about is infrastructure. It's boring. It's dull. But one of the things that happens is a certain pattern kicks in. And that pattern is a simple one. If you've got a funder, and the funder is saying, we're going to put money into A, and you've got a researcher, and they're studying B, what do you think happens in that situation? What does any reasonable researcher do in that situation? They triangulate. They try and figure out how it is that their research interest intersects with this other inter research interest. And then they propose projects that basically propose that they will address A through B in some way. And you see this with infrastructure all the time. You'll see people say, as we did recently at a big conference in DC, say, fantastic. There's a lot of money out there to fund infrastructure. I have this fantastic project that's looking at, um, at uh, phenotype, genotype relationships. And, um, and if you fund this, a byproduct of that funding will be that we'll create an identifier system and a storage system for actually tracking this stuff and allowing to cite it and allow you to include it in papers. Now, how many research projects have you seen that have actually produced infrastructure as a byproduct that has then gone off to live? 
There are probably one or two exceptions. You can think of some of the big gene banks and stuff like that that have come out that have been funded separately. But by and large, this almost never works. What happens is the researchers develop some software, some concept, they put it up on a server, and when the grant runs out, the server goes down, the data goes down with it, and the so-called infrastructure that they built disappears. Now imagine, for a second, that we funded physical infrastructure this way. Your grant runs out, your lights go out. Your water gets cut off. You're stuck there without any of these things that you depend on. This isn't a way to run infrastructure. It's actually getting a little bit worse. Because now people are saying that one of the solutions to our infrastructure problems is to use the cloud. Now in the past, if you didn't pay your electric bill, they'd come and they'd turn off your power. And if you pay them, they'd turn it back on. When you start using the cloud, it would be the equivalent of not paying your bill, them coming, turning off your electricity, and ripping out the wiring. At least in the past, you had a hope. You had a hard drive stuck in a closet, something that you might be able to revive. Now we're actually putting our faith in infrastructure into something even more ephemeral, something that disappears or can disappear even more quickly if funding runs out. So this pattern that we've already seen of trying to fund infrastructure with, um, through grants for fundamental research and then being surprised that it doesn't work, seems to me that this could actually get a lot worse. In case you're wondering, this is a salad. <laughs> and it's time for me to digress a little bit. Because one of the other things that happens in our industry is what I call um, the the you know, salad or honey roast syndrome. There are a few words, and I just noticed this really when I moved away from the US. Um, and I come back, and I realize that there are some words in the food industry that people will use to make the most unhealthy thing on earth sound appetizing. Salad. You can get roast beef salad. You can get taco salad. You can get potato salad. You can get and many of you will have this probably, no doubt, later this week, marshmallow salad. Basically, they try and make things that are awful for you sound healthy. And conversely, there's this perverse other trick that happens, which is that they'll use phrases like honey roast to try and describe something that is actually help, healthy for you and make it sound appetizing. So you'll find honey roast salmon. Or I kid you not, if you go to Whole Foods and you look at their whole wheat pita bread, they are flavored with molasses. So we've got these two things, and the technical world has almost the identical thing. If you use words like open, distributed, um, lightweight, framework, and you throw them at anything, you can almost make it sound reasonable. Try it. I'm going to create a lightweight, open, distributed framework for DRM. The worst bloody thing on earth, but you can make it sound vaguely reasonable by throwing those keywords in it. And the truth is, a lot of those words are phatic. They don't really mean things. They're code words for saying, we lack trust in our ability to judge things. And therefore, we're deferring a lot of complicated decisions by saying, we'll distribute it. Or it's a framework. We're not going to nail you down to an actual API or, God forbid, an application. We're going to create a framework. You know, um, We don't trust each other to run this thing. And we certainly don't trust a central authority to run this thing. So we'll make it distributed. And this doesn't really work. Here's another challenge for you. It's the, you know, I coined this rule a while. Distributed begets centralized. I cannot name a fundamental internet communication mechanism distributed that was not distributed and then centralized in order to make it usable, including the web itself. The web would be virtually useless if we didn't have Google. And if Google wasn't there, it would be somebody else. So every time we try and pull this little trick of saying, OK, we'll distribute it. And funders love hearing this. They're like, you know, 
the researchers go, okay, well, we're going to have this, this fantastic research project, and we're going to create this little bit of infrastructure. And um, rather than hold us to actually creating an organization and something to run this for some time, we punt. We say, oh, it's going to be distributed. And that's going to solve our problem. And so often, it doesn't. So this is the salad digression. A lot of times what you hear is people trying to punt difficult decisions about infrastructure by using you know, technical jargon, by trying to uh, pretend that a lot of the difficult decisions about running an infrastructure can be deferred or that they can be washed away simply by saying, it's someone else's problem. We're going to let lots of other people run it. And the danger here, the danger here is if you don't acknowledge from the start that it is very likely that if you distribute something, somebody else is going to come and centralize it, then you're basically ignoring a very dangerous reality, which is that the whole thing can be co-opted and enclosed, and so that all of the progress that people are making in opening up content, in opening up data, could ultimately be reversed by then enclosing the very infrastructure that we use to gain access to this data and to this content. And of course, if anybody recognizes these, we've got several plugs, European, American, and I forget what this one is. I think it's actually a washing machine plug. The other issue is that, of course, when we talk about a lot of this distributed stuff, what happens is that it's distributed at a minimal way. It requires tons of shims, tons of adapters in order to actually get the stuff to work with each other. And this is one of the other uh, problems that we have with distributed. Effectively, when people are using a lot of these terms, when they're using terms like distributed and framework and lightweight and, oh, yes, before I forget, a new one that I keep encountering is fabric. Fabric. Have you heard this in the technical world? Oh, please don't use it. It's just appalling. Um, basically, it just means tightly interconnected, as far as I can tell. These are all trust issues. Basically, what people are saying when they say this is, we don't trust somebody else to run the technology. We don't trust central organizations. We're not sure that we know what we're doing, and therefore, we want to late bind these decisions by making it into a framework instead of an application. And so a lot of these things, I think, deep down, are actually about trust. Now, trust was something, to get back to the topic at hand, that we encountered big problems with when we were starting up ORCID. ORCID actually started as a Crossref project. When I first joined Crossref, about 20 days later, Amy had arranged a meeting, I think it was at PSP, in February, to talk about what at the time were called author DOIs. The idea was, can we assign identifiers to authors to deal with the disambiguation problem that people were having uh, with author names in the scholarly literature? And this project started, and one of the first things that I did was I started going out and interviewing various stakeholders, publishers, obviously, because they're our main members, um, but also librarians and researchers and funders and um, other kinds of you know, third parties uh, to talk about what it would take to actually build this infrastructure for dealing with, with identifiers for authors. And at the time, one of the things that we learned was that the things that were required were at the time things that Crossref couldn't provide. And one of them was trust. And the simple reason was that Crossref was managed by publishers. And a lot of the stakeholders, a lot of the people who would have been important to buy into this system, were already concerned that Crossref was running a system that identified content and that they didn't have any say in that system. And they were certainly very concerned that something as fundamental as authors was similarly managed. So the message that we got back was, yes, this is a fantastic idea, but whatever organization that you develop or whatever system runs this, it's got to be trustworthy. It's got to be something that represents all the stakeholders in a way that's transparent, principled, that we understand, 
And this is where we actually started thinking about, OK, given that there's this you know, unbelievable pressure to reject centralized systems for infrastructure, and most of these are probably based on mistrust of said centralized system, is there anything that we can do to address the concerns about infrastructure, and particularly centralized infrastructure, that might help us move forward? And so we came up with the 10 principles that are currently ORCID's principles. And I think that these principles, and I think that other people who were involved with ORCID at the time, uh, were hugely important in garnering the trust of the community and getting people to invest in this fundamental infrastructure for the community. So it was at this stage, when we, when we formed these principles, after that, uh, occasionally I would meet with, as I said, Cameron or Jennifer, and we talk about those principles, and we talk about why other people weren't doing similar things, and why we couldn't build um, an infrastructure that wasn't quite so specific, uh, that only dealt with author identifiers, but also an infrastructure that dealt with some of the other fundamental problems we had. And we were still encountering sort of resistance, you know, about this notion that, oh gosh, but if we did that, you know, how would you govern it? How would it be? How would you run it? It would be a huge bureaucracy. It would turn sclerotic. And so we came up with what we think, because we think that the ORCID principles are very good, but we decided to document some of the other concerns that were raised as we started talking to people about these issues. And so what I'd like to do is talk about some principles that we could use if we were to found, fund, found and fund an organization that managed fundamental scholarly cyber infrastructure. Because I think that if we actually created one of these, organizations, if we were able to do it, we might actually be able to solve a lot of the problems that plague us when we talk about trying to advance scholarly communication over the next several decades. So the first one is coverage. And this is basically straight out of the, um, out of the uh, uh, ORCID principles. Research transcends I mean, the research infrastructure should transcend disciplines, geographies, institutions, and stakeholders. Okay? That is, it makes no sense, and this happens time and time again. I go to a meeting of chemists, and they talk about the fact that they need mechanisms for identifying and citing chemical structures, and that this is a fundamentally different thing from the biologists who are talking about how they want to be able to identify and cite proteins and, and other uh, research objects in the literature. Every one of these things starts off with the assumption that that discipline seems to have a unique problem and that if they solve it for the discipline, then everything's all right. But then what happens if you're doing any cross-disciplinary research? It falls apart. And so one of the things that we have to do is get beyond this discipline si silo um, fixation that we have. Geography. Geography is the other bugbear because so many funders are national you inevitably have somebody come up and say, we will create a gigantic database of the biomedical literature for the United States. And then what happens is that you have to clone this thing in Europe to create the exact, uh, virtually the exact same thing um, with some other you know, uh, uh, knobs and add-ons and things like that. Ultimately, you do that because, and again, this is a fundamental issue, if you de dig deep down inside, the issue is that the UK and Europe think, wow, this is a really important resource, but we can't trust another government to run this on our behalf. We have to have some sort of say in this too. We have to have a copy of it, and that's the solution that they use. So transcending geography is vital. Research transcends geography all the time. Institutions, we have the institutional uh, repositories out there. Um, which in my mind are a classic example of the centralized of the baguette, of the centralized baguettes centralized, um, where some of the only you know effective search engines, if you look beyond Google and Google Scholar, are things like um, uh, OAIster and uh, uh, what is it, Open Door or something like that. Uh, one of which is based on Google anyway, and the other which is OCLC, right? So we have to also think beyond institutions and then stakeholders. The number of times we sit there and we go, we're going to build an identifier that's going to be useful to publishers. And you think, well, actually, this is going to be useful to funders as well. 
and it's going to be useful to researchers, and it's going to be useful to institutions. We have this repeated thing that we create these little silos. Infrastructure has to transcend these if it's going to be truly useful, cyber infrastructure. Governance. Now, these things seem obvious, and they beg lots of questions. First of all, it should be stakeholder governed. And this seems you know, clear. If you have an organization that is simply run by uh, libraries, then the publishers are probably not going to participate uh, with huge willingness. And if you've got one that's run completely by publishers, then librarians and researchers and funders are not going to um, you know, participate with full confidence. So one of the things we have to do is actually try and get something that represents the varied stakeholders in the infrastructure and find out um, and, and allow them to govern the system. And in order to do this, quite frankly, because you can't predict who the stakeholders are, you should have a policy of non-discriminatory membership. That basically, if someone's interested enough, that by definition makes them a stakeholder. And that somehow you have to accommodate them in your governance structure. Transparent operations within uh, the confines of privacy law. Um, one of the big fears that you have with any organization is that it starts working for itself. That it starts trying to perpetuate itself that it loses track of what's going on and that it is basically plotting in the background. So without transparent operations, you're never going to gain trust in the organization and trust that the organization is doing what people want it to do. Now, this is a controversial one. Cannot lobby. And again, the reason for this principle is that lots of people fear organizations just trying to keep themselves alive, and rightfully so. Lots of organizations just seem to self-perpetuate, even when they've gone beyond their immediate utility. And one of the ways in which they do this is they might go and lobby to change laws to make sure that they still are necessary. Now, we're not saying that the membership can't go out and lobby. If their constituency cares as much, much about that infrastructure as they should, then the membership should go out and lobby, not, not the organization itself. The membership should be driving an environment that enables that infrastructure to work, not the organization itself. A living will. If you're talking about infrastructure, you need to know what happens if all things go wrong. What happens to the data? What happens to the infrastructure? Who does it get passed to? How is that documented? How is it going to be enabled? Living will is an essential part of gathering trust in any kind of infrastructure. And this last one, this is a very controversial one, but again, it goes to this concept that so many people are worried about organizations just becoming unresponsive and existing to keep themselves going. Now, a mission-driven organization, there's a funny thing about it. It might be able to fulfill its mission. Isn't that a concept? Now, how many organizations do you know that have gone off and just fulfilled a mission and then have not gone right off and created another one or defined a mission so broad that they can never fulfill it and therefore they, get, they effectively uh, you know, guarantee their, their, their permanence? So one of the worries is, is there a mechanism that we can actually use to, actually, to encourage this organization to solve the problem, even if it means disbanding itself in the process? Sustainability. You have to be concerned that the thing is going to be there in the long run. And this gets back to the funding cycles. And you, know, you don't want to fund electricity on a grant cycle. Time-limited funds are used only for time-limited activities. There have to be other revenue streams that are more predictable. It could be an endowment. It could be services that you charge for. Um, we're you know, completely open about that. But time-limited funds are not something that you should use it. You can use time-limited funds for extra stuff, but not for the fundamental operations of the, uh, of the system. The goal should be to generate a surplus. And this, again, is a controversial thing. The number of times that you see people building infrastructures in our industry and saying it's sustainable, which means it's break-even, that means it's barely hanging on, this is an incredibly fragile position to be in. It means that if the, if the environment changes, if new technologies come out, you don't have the wherewithal to respond. If you don't generate a surplus, you're brittle. 
a healthy organization, one that's thriving as opposed to just sustaining itself, needs to actually generate a surplus. And one of the first things they need to do with that surplus is create a contingency fund. And that contingency fund should allow them to operate for at least a year. And again, this is to deal with the inevitable changes in the environment, changes in technology. And when these things occur, that's the hardest time to try and go out and get grants and to get extra money in order to weather these, uh, these systems. So having some sort of responsible contingency fund will help to build trust in the per permanence and in the um, sustainability of an organization. This one is a big one, and this is something that we learned at Crossref back when Amy was there. And that is that revenue based on services, not on data. Okay? So one of the things that we often see is that we're building new infrastructures to handle open content and to, and to handle open data. Now the last thing we want to do is be in a position where the way that we make money is by enclosing that very data again. So we want to make sure that, again, metadata and data fundamental to the research endeavor is actually remains open, which basically means that the organizations that are running these services and these infrastructures need to raise their money off of services and not the data itself. Revenue generation should be consistent with the mission. And again, this sounds a little bit bizarre. But when Crossref was founded, all right, remember, our mission is to enable people to link and cite the literature. One of the business models that existed was that we charged publishers to look up references and resolve them to DOIs, which worked almost exactly against our mission. And so for the first few years of Crossref, and Amy was there and she can tell you about it, growth was flatlining. And it was a hugely, hugely important debate in the board when they actually changed that business rule to lift that charge. And then all of a sudden, the entire organization took off and started the hockey stick. If you actually start to try and raise revenue on things that actually go against your mission, you're going to be in big trouble. And finally, and I am wrapping up, insurance. Because Inevitably, again, when I outline all of the first principles, people are still a bit queasy. People still think, wow, do we really want to have an organization, you know, one central organization in charge of infrastructure that's so important to so many in so many different countries and so many different disciplines, institutions, and so on. And this is one thing that I think ORCID really got right, and it got it from the open source movement. And that is that they have the ultimate insurance. And that ultimate insurance is forkability. Now, for those of you who have worked in open source, you'll know that, in theory, anybody could download the source code for a major project like, uh, 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 like uh, you know, Apache or OpenOffice, and they could just create their own version of it. But there are such big sort of penalties to doing that because suddenly you lose the momentum of the other developers who were working with you, of the other, of the entire community, that forking a major project is actually a fairly rare event. Still, sometimes it's necessary, as is the case with open office, as has been the case with um, some other uh, you know, major open source projects. And so making sure that the fundamental infrastructure is run on open source, that the data, the fundamental data in this, is actually open data within constraints of privacy laws. That the data is available in a practical way. That is, that you at least create dumps of it periodically. These things, in the ORCID case, are the insurance policy that say, look, if all else fails, if somehow, even with all the checks and balances we've put into place, we turn evil, you can take the code, the data, and you can go and start up your own system. And if you can bring the community with you, you will win. This is a fundamental insurance policy. The only other principle that I think we would add to this is a patent non-assertion principle, 
because in still, in theory, somebody could actually release the code and release the data and still tie it up and make it unusable because of patents. So a patent on assertion would be a critical addition to this. But this concept of forkability we see as the ultimate insurance. We don't want, obviously, this to happen. But this is the thing that holds the organization to, you know, uh, responsible to meet the needs of its stakeholders. Because ultimately they know if they don't meet the needs of the stakeholders, if the stakeholders get upset enough, they can actually take the whole thing and they can create a new organization to fill the mandate of the stakeholders instead of the unresponsive organization running it. So coverage, governance, sustainability, and insurance. These are the biggies. And they represent a huge gap. Now, it's interesting to sit around and think about some of the organizations that meet some or a few of these principles. There are you know, obvious ones that you might think of, like CERN, or Wikimedia, or Duraspace, or you know, Ithaca. They meet some of them. They don't meet all of them. And maybe it is an aspirational set of principles. But if I were a funder, and if I saw time and time again that the major projects that I was funding that you know, depended on there being infrastructure in order to make them persistent, to make them permanent, to allow other projects to build on them, if I saw infrastructure failing time and time again, I, as a funder, would be trying to work with other funders to figure out how we build an organization that meets these needs and that can actually provide the infrastructure services upon which so many interesting, new, boundary-pushing research projects depend. Now, the Maslow hierarchy of needs is kind of a... <clears throat> But ultimately, we really cannot get to some of these other things until we have this straight. And we don't have this straight. We have bits and pieces of it. We have gaps. But we need to build this foundation, the infra, the underlying part. And finally, I'm going to close with this. In my abstract, I used the term Quonset hut. And my English colleague said, what the hell is that? Um, and for those of you who don't know, a Quonset hut is a temporary shelter. They were particularly popular uh, in World War II as temporary shelters during World War II. And this is basically a glorified Quonset hut. Anybody know what it is? This is Building 20, the famous Building 20 of MIT. This was a temporary structure put up during World War II to house some major research projects, research on radiation, more importantly, the Tech Model Railroad Club. But some of the most interesting research projects ever came out of this sort of dilapidated shack that was put up. And it was only torn down in something like 1998 or something like that. Uh, it lasted way longer as a as a, but it wasn't infrastructure. It was the seed for many, many research projects. But today you can see people making promises. We'll put up a Quonset hut. And as a byproduct, you're going to get an electrical grid. You're going to get infrastructure. That hasn't worked. This produced many, many, many research projects, many you know, breakthroughs. But as far as I know, the infrastructure it produced was, you know, was negligible. So, Effectively, what I'm trying to say is that we've got to stop this process. We've actually got to stop asking researchers how to fund infrastructure. They have very little affinity with the process, with the responsibility, with the requirements of infrastructure. Funders, institutions, publishers, all stakeholders need to seriously think about getting people who actually are good at running infrastructure to think about these problems. And they have to get over the fear of funding infrastructure as a separate line item, as something independent of, independent of research projects. And if we can do that, and I am optimistic, then conferences like these, where we're trying to shake it up, where we're trying to think about the future 
of publishing, we'll be able to actually move forward instead of getting bogged down in the day-to-day -day routine tasks that seem to stymie us all whenever we try and advance scholarly communication. And those issues almost always have to do with infrastructure. Thank you very much. And again, I'd like to thank Cameron Nalen and Jennifer Lynn uh, for their input on this. Couple questions if anybody has them. And uh, I'll, I'll give you something to chew on while I take the microphone over here, which is you use. Uh, are there areas uh, of the maybe the insurance policy that you mentioned, or the, the, the self-assertion, non-assertion patent rights that you see ORCA not taking off this question? Well, um, I mean, the argument at the time when we brought up uh, the issue of patent rights was that we have no patents, which, you know, it seemed a bit odd. Um, I'm not, I mean, you know, I think that this would, it would be fantastic. Um, I think any organization that meets some of these principles should be aiming uh, to meet more of them. And um, I'm the first to say that, uh, you know, I, I, you know, same thing with uh, Crossref. Crossref doesn't meet all of these principles. Uh, Cameron will point out that PLOS does not meet all of these principles. Um, ORCA doesn't either. And, but, you know, these are, these are things to aspire to. I think that the more that they adopt, the more trustworthy, the more um, faith people will have in the system. So, you know, by all means. I mean, the big issue with ORCA is that I think that it's, um, you know, vaguely shameful uh, that funders and institutions haven't uh, invested more in the organization um, because it does represent something you know that they've been trying to do uh, for ages um, and there it is it's out there it's ready and um, and all it requires is a bit more of a kick and uh, it will it, it will really help to transform scholarship by the way I'm not affiliated with Orchid anymore <laughs> Oh, I had a question. You said um, that they should have incentives to wind down. Um, yes. But how do you have a sustainable organization that sustains infrastructure if it winds down? Well, I mean, the, uh, the, this gets back to the idea of that if you're a mission-driven organization, presumably you might be able to fulfill your mission. So the idea would be if you could make yourself unnecessary, you should wind down. Now. It's interesting, I mean, you know, a commercial organization has a perpetual sort of responsibility to try and make returns for its investors and so on and so forth. A mission-driven organization, right, um, doesn't have that kind of uh, requirement. I it understand, could. but if the mission is to sustain something essentially forever, how does that ever wind down? What if I came up with a, with a way of not needing DOIs? Uh, that would be a fantastic um, advance. It would be wonderful for the entire um, scholarly ecosystem. It would save publishers a lot of money. Um, and um, it would be a good thing. So the issue is, you know, there could possibly be ways to actually make yourself unnecessary or less necessary. And I just don't think that organizations are, in fact, incentivized to explore these, to look for them. They, you know, they, they, like any organization, organiz they tend to try and grow. Um, is that, Eric, you got to? So I would argue that the most successful um, way to, to build internet infrastructure is not the builder model, mm -hmm. uh, but rather the Google model. Um, but I can see where the builder model is also useful in certain situations, the question is, which kinds of infrastructure are best attacked with a Google model, and which kinds of problems are attacked best with a builder model? So um, absolutely, don't get me wrong. Uh, the Google model uh, manifestly succeeds. Um, the commercial model, uh, time and time again, succeeds. Uh, sometimes, I think, um, to our detriment. And by our detriment, I mean uh, the, you know, the people, stakeholders, and scholarly communication. Um, if we have an organization that fundamentally controls so much important data that researchers are used and it's utterly opaque and has no stakeholder governance, 
and um, and could be cut, you know, basically cut in a budget uh, swipe, you know, tomorrow. Uh, this should be of concern to us. So I'm not arguing that the builder model is easier; it's much harder. But I'm arguing that the other models that exist leave us vulnerable, and leave us in a situation where we've, you know, opened data and we've opened publications, and suddenly uh, all of the mechanisms that we need in order to access them and use them effectively uh, are enclosed uh, behind our back. Okay, I think with that, another round of applause for Jeff. Thank you very much. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Music